before we get started, and before I introduce our honored guest speaker today, a uh, couple items. First, I wanted to thank all of the sponsors who participated in today's event. First, uh, starting with uh, Gensler Architects. Thank you so much from Gensler. <laughs> Turner Construction. Uh, the USGBC Los Angeles and the Orange County chapters. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you to the AIA Los Angeles. And finally, I'd like to thank um, my, my friends at Glumac, uh, specifically Edwin Lee and Richard Holzer. Uh, Edwin is the managing principal of the Los Angeles office, and Richard's the managing principal of the Irvine office. Uh, but also, most importantly, to thank Winnie, Lindsay, Quinny, and Kimberly, who put this whole event together. Where is Kimberly? Let's give Kimberly a massive round of applause. I think she did a great, great job in organizing this event. I'd also like to thank all of you that participated in purchasing full tables, including my friends at AC Martin, Chevron, HMC Architects, and I won't do this one very well because I don't have my glasses on, unfortunately, but Moulet Pouladez Architects, and Enclose and Victolic. So thank you all for, for participating. Before we get started, if you could please check your cell phone and make sure that it's on vibrate or that you've turned it off. And now I'd like to introduce Christoph Ingenhoven. First met Christoph about three years ago uh, when he came and did a tour on the West Coast. And you are really going to enjoy this presentation. It's spectacular. And I was fortunate enough to go back to Germany and to not only visit his in incredible office, but to see many of his projects that you'll see today. And uh, I think you'll, you'll see they're just absolutely amazing. The only thing I'll say about Christoph is that he graduated from, and I won't do this right again, Christoph, but I'll Ahem University. He'll correct me when he comes up. In 1984, and he was fortunate to win a design competition in 1985 at the age of 25, which launched his career. And he'll be telling you the rest for there. So let's give him a big round of applause for Christoph Ingenhoven. Thank you for the opportunity to introduce you to our work and run you through kind of picture show. I will try to concentrate on each project on one aspect. So they are, I mean, they are not similar from style, but they are similar solutions somehow. So you will get from every aspect a little detail. This is the office. Uh, there are roughly 100 people, mainly architects. Um, we, are, we are pretty much doing the traditional architectural job. Um, in our days, it is not just architecture. So we're integrating all the engineers in our contracts. Mainly 70, 80% of our contracts are contracts with integrated engineering. And that means we are respecting the engineers from the first uh, white sheet of paper on. We invite them to take part in the, in the very early design stages. Um, what I will show to you would have not been possible without that kind of collaboration. And to close friends, meanwhile, uh, we try to keep the same team together for nearly all the projects, which is not always possible, but mainly we, we are successful in doing that. First of all, I would like to introduce some of our principles. I know that would be a lecture in itself, so I shorten it a little bit. Um, I think that form does not follow any of these fashionable aphorisms like chaos or fun or whatever people like for form to follow. I, I think form follows evolution. For sure, it follows evolution in nature. Um, I think in an evolution style design process, uh, we are able to find solutions which are similar, at least, on their way to the beauty nature provides. If 
we are not too much adding to what is necessary. I'm a strong believer that things are beautiful if they are just made out of things you really need. One of my former partners mentioned once that if you take something away from a building from our office, there is then a hole in the facade later. Or it is not possible to add something to a building from the office without damaging it. And it is not necessary to add something. Um, there are two principles in green building which I would like to introduce to you. One is triple zero. Triple zero means no waste, no emission, no energy. This is a very, very high aim, I know. It's not possible to fulfill that 100% just, just from zero on. Uh, we have to do many projects. We have to try and error. We have to, to look for the best solution. I mean, solutions are not the same all over the world. Uh, what we can get from somewhere to somewhere else is we can take an approach, but I think there has to be local solutions for local problems, even so that energy efficiency is a global issue. Super green goes beyond that. Uh, we try to express with super green that it's not just about measuring energy or lowering or hiring, high, higher, higher the energy efficiency, lowering the energy demand. It is more than that. It's about equal treatment. It is about equal rights. It's about better opportunities and so on. So it's a political question. It's not just a question of architecture and form and design. It is about less. If you look to your cities, and it's, it's not the same in our cities, but the tendency is the same. Uh, if you look to your cities, that is definitely not the answer. Because uh, even though that this city looks quite dense, it's not by far not dense enough. A city like, or a part of the city like Manhattan and New York could be a solution. Uh, a very vital, mixed city, residential, offices, um, retail, everything on one place, very dense. I think that is the future. If you look to the statistics saying that Houston, Texas, for example, consumes eight times the energy per capita as Copenhagen does, or it spends the same time, four to five times the square meter per capita that Copenhagen does, does, and you know how good life you have in Copenhagen, so you think that is impossible, but I think you, you, you have to change. I mean, it's not possible to go ahead with these artistic kind of buildings with uh, no influence from the user to the climber, with a closed facade, with no operable windows, with a fully air-conditioned control, and things like that. Even in a climber like Los Angeles, and Los Angeles might be supposed to be uh, very hot and sometimes humid and so on and difficult without air conditioning. I experienced, for example, this morning, I mean, it's mid-June, it's not cold. Um, it would be possible today to ventilate a building in Los Angeles naturally, no problem. But where should be the problem? It might be a problem for some days of the year, so we have to solve the problem then. But I would show to you pr projects from regions in the world, this, they are much, much more problematic in, 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 uh, with uh, climate and humidity and, and, and temperature than you are. Efficiency is another word I would like to introduce because people think that efficient things look boring or bad or could, could be no good architecture. I found that the most efficient things that human beings ever made are the most beautiful things on and, and if you look to that ship, for example, you will, you will in no way get these people to take something on board they not really need. So by not taking anything on board what you don't need, you get out one of the most beautiful designs man has ever made, so, or woman. So uh, I think that is encouraging us as architects and engineers to look exactly for that and nothing else. We started our career when I was 25, as Steve mentioned, but 
we never get that building where we won the competition for build. And so we follow the next competition and the next competition. We won us two or three of them, big projects, never built. It was an economical base for the office, but after 11 years in the practice, we were finally successful realizing a building. So in 19, six, 1996, this building, which is a high rise for the RWE, uh, the RWE is one of the biggest energy supplier, originally energy supply in Germany, and then, of course, they had a monopoly. They were a very rich company. Um, they've taken over other companies. Meanwhile, they are one of the biggest German companies on the stock market. And um, this was a building we won a competition for in 1991. And then finally, we got a five to six years later build. The one thing I would like to mention about that building is that the general idea of that building is to rationalize the surface volume ratio to a minimum, which a circle can, and then put around the building a double skin facade to make mainly two things possible, to have the sunshade in the cavity protected for the wind, so with any wind condition you can have that in, in action. You don't need any glare protection anymore, additionally to that, and then for openable windows. So Behind that glass shield, which keeps the wind outside, you're not just allowed to have the sun shading uh, whenever you like, but you, sh you can also all the day through, all the year through, open the windows whenever you like. So this is a double skin, 100% glass, um, sliding doors in the second level. First level, just one glass panel, and then a double glass panel um, uh, on the second level. Um, you see that is a cavity, in between you would have the sunshade. Uh, this is a bracket that holds it all together. This is, again, a kind of principle in the buildings we do. It's, we try to concentrate and to reduce the complexity to where we can handle it. And that is the one complex point in the building. All the other things around the facade are just cut at glass. Just a panel of glass cut it in the right size, that's it. And the bracket is the only real complex design. And the bracket is for getting the air in, as well as leaving it um, and, and release it. It is about the sun shading in the middle. It's about an additional blind. Uh, inside, it's a, it's, it's a sliding door. Uh, it's an outside windshield. And this is how it looks from inside, provides an extremely transparent uh, uh, interior. Uh, it's uh, done with white glass, so it's a, really a very transparent building. But people still like it very much. This is a completely different project, very, very small compared to the RWE building, a fun project. We felt a little bit like on a stage doing that because it was for uh, Audi, a car, the car manufacturers, um, we built five times around the world in Detroit, in Tokyo, in Geneva, in Frankfurt, and in, um, and in uh, Paris. This pavilion, uh, the pavilion itself is a self-standing, double-curved construction. So we developed it to help Audi to get a more emotional approach to the customer. It's done with 13,000 pieces of triangular glass. Uh, roughly uh, 1,200 different sizes. Um, we hold it all together with that kind of detail. It's uh, fixed by that cables hanging from the curved steel uh, beams. And then all together, this is not just a transparent uh, surface or facade, however you like to call that. It's the same time the construction. And it shows maybe also another principle of the office we don't hide anything. I, mean, I don't like, personally, I don't like anything to hide. No, no hidden cores, no ductwork behind walls, no uh, cavities where, it, where you can't get or step in, you can't control. Uh, I would like our buildings to be what they are looking like. So if you touch them and it's metal, it looks like metal, it is metal, it is glass, it's glass, if it is construction, it's a construction. It does not say I'm, 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 I'm something else as I, as I look like. 
This is um, the first building we did for a, an American uh, investor, Gary Hines from uh, Houston, who then uh, changed to, to London personally. I think he still lives there. Um, and uh, he, he took us as architects from the former client uh, of that site, it was a bank, a German bank. It is, as you see, the tallest building in Munich. What, what is not tall? Because it's just 150 meters. Um, he didn't personally didn't like uh, the idea of a du double skin facade. He, he thinks it spends too much money and space and things like that. What he accepted is the need in an European project for the need in a European and especially German project for natural ventilation. And so we try to look for a solution where it is possible to open small circular windows driven by a mechanical small motor um, and make in a single, a single layer facade natural ventilation possible. And that looks like this. Um, so we are driving out these circular windows. You can move them extremely uh, slightly. So if you have high wind pressure, you just open them by millimeters. Uh, you get enough air in, and if it is slow wind and no problem, you open them to 35 to 40 centimeters, you get a lot of air in. So that works for 66% of the year for natural, naturally ventilating this tower. This is how that looks like. Very, very simple. Uh, it's in the middle of the glass panel. Meso momentum allows us to, to, to cut that hole in without any additional glass thickness. And then just that one line, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a power cable, nothing special. And the motor is integrated into the window itself, provides 66% natural ventilation, is surrounded by a small garden, quite a beautiful kind of campus around. So positioned directly the opposite side of the street from the Olympic Stadium, one of the, for me, most admirable buildings from the 70s in Germany. Um, a real, a, a, a great construction from Fry Otto and Günther Benisch. This is, again, a completely different project. We did the headquarter of Lufthansa in Frankfurt, Frankfurt Airport. Um, Lufthansa had the privilege, in a way, to get relatively cheap uh, a building site directly in the airport or directly on the border of the airport. Um, the problem with that is it's surrounded by noise. So if you look at that picture, you see the A3 in the background, the most frequented motorway in Europe, and then you have all this local traffic around. As well, you have a high-speed train uh, track directly on the back of the building, and then here the airport starts. So it's really surrounded by, by noise. The question was how we could provide a building with natural ventilated offices, uh, human scale, uh, nice to have, attracting people to work there for Lufthansa, commuting from maybe on a daily basis, maybe on a weekly, maybe on a weekly basis from Hamburg, Munich, somewhere else in Europe to Frankfurt to work for the week. And this is how it looks like. It is a, that's the first, the first stage of the project. This is 10 office wings and 10 gardens. It's surrounded by a vertical glass facade. It's covered by a canopy uh, in alteration of glass steel shell and concrete shell, a very light construction. That is the whole design, meant to look like a power glider. Um, it's coming out a rational reason, because uh, the incoming planes have a, very have a kind of restriction following them uh, about the height of the buildings with, with uh, getting higher and higher with a bigger distance from the runway. And so we had to keep under this line. Uh, a small short tour through the building itself. This is a drop-off zone. Um, the only garden which is outside, all the other gardens are inside window gardens, where we have the drop-off. Uh, this is the entrance hall. We have a central spine, meant to be much bigger than a normal spine would be for that 10 fingers, cause it is supposed to be much bigger at the end, 30 fingers and 30 gardens. So we had to provide a real strong inner, uh, inner lifeline with atrias, with uh, open voids, with, with, with vertical 
uh, with, with stairways, uh, elevators, things like that, all in, integrated into that spine. A look from the very top. Um, there are meeting points from uh, every third finger has one in front of it. There are, this is how it looks from the very top. Then where the, the wings come together, that we, have, we have like central services, restaurants, cafeteria, conference zone, things like that. They are surrounded by these fingers. In the fingers itself, we are providing a full transparent inner partition wall. And the only not fully transparent partition wall was for the CEO, where we put an artwork on, on it to make sure that it is not to 100% transparent. But um, this is the normal office environment. It's, it's an open landscape, which is a little bit unusual for Germany. Um, the Germans like that one to, to double uh, offices, uh, very boring, very non-communicative in a way. Uh, in all our buildings, we convinced the client to get away from that, get a more, more dense office environment. At the same time, we didn't want to, to provide the typical 70s office with 40 to 40 meters or even more, 400 people sitting there in a, in a flat environment. We want that to be a real landscape, and people enjoy that pretty much. It, is, it takes some time to convince them, but at the end, all of them enjoy very much to work in an environment like that. This is one of the terraces, gives you an impression about how that looks, or from the atrium itself. Uh, there are gardens in between the fingers, as I mentioned. Um, this one is what we call the Californian beach. You should, you should know what that looks like, a Californian beach. This is, this is more Mediterranean-like uh, garden. It comes from, I mean, it's not heated, it's not cooled. It is just a temperature as a result of the inside and outside temperature. So it's, it's, it's between 5 degree plus to something, 28, 27. A bamboo garden. Again, the Californian one with beach body about as well. <laughs> I checked that this morning on the beach. It looks like that. <laughs> the only thing I, I'm, I'm missing here is the sea. But we are waiting for the next project to integrate some some bigger water into it. This is, I mean, we had to provide a real 100% transparency for that, because everybody with his office is orientated to one of these gardens. So he looks just outside through a facade like that. So what we did is, together with Werner Sobik, we, and we developed this kind of hanging, suspended steel construction fixed with that beam on top, and then it provides a clear, very crisp white glass transparency to the outside. It's combined with a timber frame facade for the normal offices. Um, timber has the advantage that physically it's always warm, so it doesn't, it, it allows to uh, furnish the office much nearer to the facade, even if it's outside temperature quite a bit minus, like minus 10, minus 20. Because uh, our problem today is not anymore the glass, but the profiles. And if it is aluminum, for example, the heat exchange and the cooled exchange is much higher than with timber. And then it's rated, FSC rated, certified material. You have a balcony in front of your door. You can open that drawer as well as, a, as that kind of small window on top of the door. So it's very individual. It's very safe. You don't get rain in. You, you don't have any security problem because it's in in the house, that is how it looks like, balconies. At the very end of the building, you have a double skin facade, because this is the exemption from the rule. You don't have the garden anymore, so you have to have a double skin facade to provide a, a similar condition for the inside. It's precessed and lead gold. Uh, Lufthansa didn't want to follow that anymore, because they think it's a European company, which we should follow some European rules. So we get the, the so-called green building partner of the European Union, which means we are 25% lower than the energy demand should be in Germany. There is a quite strong uh, energy regulation in Germany. Uh, it's called Energie Einsparform, which means energy efficiency rule. And uh, with 25% lower, you are uh, comfortably lower than 100 kilowatts per year and per square meter which is difficult to get even. So uh, how that works, 
This is one of the gardens again, a tea garden. And the system is like you have a tube, a metal tube on one end of the building. We are, we are, the, 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 the cold outside air falls down to the building, get pre-cooled here just by being released under the building to the concrete structure. Nothing is added. And then it, it is getting into the building. And then we release with a two-time air change rate mechanically ventilation into the offices if needed, not, the whole, not for the whole year, just if needed. And that is pre-cooled by this structure. And then the atrium itself has louvers on the vertical facade. We get air in, you, get, you open your window, you just ventilate your place, no problem. And at the very top of the atrium, we have to release this air again. So you can imagine that this is maybe the most tricky de design or detail in the building. And so we talk a little bit about that. This is the roof. This is the detail where that all comes together. And here you see that it is one detail where the glass shell, the concrete shell, the vertical facade comes together. It's, it's the same time where you release the air and where you collect all the water. Not easy. So this is the water. We retreat it and have black water retreatment as well, gray water use, and things like that. And then we release the same time the warm air into the external air. The problem was that we had to make sure by testing it in wind tunnel tests and other tests that with any wind condition, this air is released and not pressed again into the atrium. So this is even more important in, in case of uh, fire because we, we don't like to have an additional fire escape route. We use the atrias as escape route. And that means that there should be no smoke. And to make sure that that all happened, we invented two flaps, this one and this on the other side. This is fixed and this is movable. And that makes sure that we have a kind of venturi effect on both sides from wherever the wind comes, makes sure that it sucks out the used air and as well the smoke from the atrium. And then it runs through a model and mock-up and testing process, a quite intensive thing. It was worthwhile doing that because the whole, the whole thing depended on it. And at the same time, we had 3,000 meter running detail. So it's, a, it's OK to invest some money and some time in, into it. This is the detail. Then this is how it looks from inside. This is how it looks from, from above. Again, this is where the air comes out. This is one of the movable flaps. Here you can see the fixed one. It gets some awards, the Reba International 2008 Award. Uh, you can read from this picture that we are not stopping to design on the roof or under the building or behind the facade or whatever. It's all part of one ambition. And the fifth facade, as we call um, the roof, for sure is one thing we have to look at. It gets a Chicago Ateneum Award and, and as well some other international awards. This is how it looks when it gets extended. So it gets three times its size. And here's something different. The Stuttgart Main Station project is a very long-lasting project. We won the competition in 1997. I was then 30, 37 years old. I told the client, You're, this is a good solution because I'm going to be still alive when the building get completed. Meanwhile, it is 13 years ago. It's still not completed. It will take us to 2019 to get it completed. Um, so hap I mean, hopefully, I'm still alive then. Um, I will run you through the project. It is in Stuttgart itself. Um, we have a kind of head station in Stuttgart from the 19th century, or beginning of 20th century, actually. Uh, a quite famous building. Um, the problem in Stuttgart is that the tracks use so much space that it was extremely economically sensible to get away from them. And there was a city planning competition uh, which we didn't want because we didn't take uh, part in it. And this was a result. And the result was to build a station in uh, in, in a complete other direction than it was before, builds tunnels under the hills, come 
come underground into the valley. So the, the, the trains which are today coming in like here, in the future come in underground from here, then through the station, and then back into the valley. And this is a very, very expensive project, four to five billion euros. It is financed. Meanwhile, we are working on the working drawings and the tender and specification. So our part is now to design mainly the station itself and the buildings around. Uh, the problem with that is a very theoretical one, and it takes a little time to explain. This is a valley again, and you have to imagine here is the existing station, and the, and the city is pretty much here. The problem in Stuttgart is that the ventilation of the whole valley is depending on that, on that place. Of course, in the evening, all from the, mountain, from, the, from the hills, the relatively cool air falls down to the valley and then follows the valley down to Bad Cannstatt to the river. If you build a building here above ground, you will stop that all. And if you remember what they suggested, they suggested ex exactly that, to build an above-ground station with a below-ground track. A little bit of contradiction, but the difference, the, the difference in, the, in the two levels, track level, what, what, what was given, and the landscape level, which is also given, is about 8 to 12 meters. And 190 of the 191 architects in the competition did not believe that they, are, that they are able to provide a beautiful space within that limitation. So they built the buildings, or, or foreseen buildings, being like 30 to 40 meters high, big glass buildings like the Milan or like the, like the Paris stations are. The problem with that is, with steam locomotives, you needed this kind of horse. But we have electrical or hybrid construction. We don't need that anymore. Of course, you don't have to get away from the steam to have a transparent view under the steam. It's just possible to build a building with 8 to 12 meters height. So what we provided is for that 500 meter long terminal, a construction that's completely underground, 28 light eyes on top of that. These light eyes are part of the construction. So the higher part of that is is a, is a kind of beam, an above ground beam that helps the construction to work. And the underground uh, environment looks like that, a, a, a hopefully very poetical space coming out of an extremely rational construction or structural idea. And the idea was developed together with Fry Otto and meanwhile together with Werner Sobeck. And the, the idea was from that drawing on, um, getting from a membrane construction which is able to show the ideal form for pure tension-loaded construction, like a membrane is, and get that around to pure pressure-loaded concrete construction which has the same form. You might remember, some of you might remember, that Antonio Gaudi built hanging models for his cathedral in Barcelona. And he did exactly the same thing. That was known before. Um, that you can do a hanging model and you turn that around 180 degree and you get from that tension loaded construction a pure pressure loaded form. What you have to respect is that this form is then given. So it's given by the conditions of, 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 of the span and, 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 and the space. So what we did is we followed all through this process with hanging models and computer models and with bigger scale hanging models and bigger scale uh, real physical models, and at the end, the construction will be 36 meters each, so this is 36 meter, and the, and the construction thickness in the middle is around 30 centimeters, so it's less than 1% of the span, which is an immense efficiency in that construction, coming out purely from that form finding process, just possible like that. It's still not possible to do that in a computer purely. You have to find the form in a model. You put that then in the computers and optimize that in a computer. But the general form is still found in a model. Uh, there's one other construction at the end of these, these concrete um, parts. We have a glass and sh uh, steel shell on four ends of the, of, of the building. We didn't want the, 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 the um, the people to get underground into the building. We wanted them to go above ground in something, a beautiful form, and then in that building or in that glass shell downwards. So this is how that looks like. This is the biggest one from these glass shells. Give an impression how that looks. 
integrated into the light eyes, get some awards even if it is not built yet, <laughs> get even more awards than build it projects. I don't know why. <laughs> Got a uh, Holcim Global Award for Sustainable Building in gold, um, which was about uh, providing a carbon-free building. The question is how that works. It's in a way simple, the, the tunnel providing constant air temperature about 16 to 17 degrees all around the year. Um, and the, the, the trains coming into the station pushes air into the station at the same time uh, outgoing train sucks uh, air out of the station. So it's a, it's a ventilation system in a way. So you get a mixture of the 17 degree constant air temperature of, of the tunnel and then the earth temperature the, and, and the outside temperature, let's say 32 degree uh, Celsius and that gets to a maximum of 27 in summer and to a minimum of 14 degree in winter, which is a very, very comfortable station because you enter a station with what you wear outside in a way. So this is cooler than outside in, in summer and significantly warmer than outside in winter. And that is done without any additional um, energy. It's coming uh, by, by many, many aspects, but one aspect is that the five meter difference, level difference of the tracks itself helps the air from the tunnel getting through the station, a little bit upward through it, getting a little bit warmer and then out to the next tunnel. It's a natural daylight at 80%, 18% of the surface is glass. Um, so you can also avoid direct sun gain because you get just step out of the sun into the shaded parts. And then the only uh, situation where you have to spend energy on is, natural, uh, is uh, artificial lighting during the night. And we provide a, f a, a big photovoltaic uh, power station for that on the existing roof of the old station. And this gives you an impression about how we, how we proceed with the design. This, these drawings are just very, very recently done. Um, as I told you, we are tendering the project. Meanwhile, it's a quite difficult process because we have to find a con construction company who is able to deal with this kind of exposed concrete structure. Uh, there's nothing you can do. There's no facade on. There's no material added to it. It's just the construction itself coming out of that formwork process and concrete process. So it has to be perfect. It has to be maintainable and things like that. It has to have a special acoustic absorption um, performance and things like that. Get as well in Chicago to Nima. And that is how it looks like in the park when it's, when it's finished. It's just one of these friendly neighbor glass eyes. You can you can, you can do projects like that in every scale. Um, this is a big scale project. This is a very, very small scale project. It's also carbon free. How does that work? It's a, again a timber construction. And uh, it's a single family house, a quite beautiful landscape. And, but the special thing about that is, because we're getting electricity from wind power, you can buy that. You, you put an additional 20 to 25% on the price. Uh, we have stormwater management, we have solar collectors for the house, and as well ground source. So we, this piling, deep piling, 150 to 170 meter, we get enough cool or relatively warm water. It depends from the outside temperature. It is warmer in winter than the outside temperature and cooler than in summer. We heat and cool the building completely with it warm water out of the solar collector. So we don't burn anything for heating, cooling, and uh, warm water in the house. And the additional electrical power we get from wind power, so it's a completely carbon-free house. Um, is that possible? Um, are, are projects naturally ventilated possible? Double skin, things like that possible in another climate zone? Yes. Um, a few days before I get here, we got a new job in Osaka on the basis of the performance of that uh, high rise I will show to you. That is Brise Tower in Osaka. It's a commission we get from Sankei. Sankei is a publishing company, publishing music, publishing uh, journals and newspapers, things like that. The situation is that the, the building is situated between the, the railway station and the, uh, the, the older parts of the city, has a transfer function as well. 
it talks on two scales in a way. It's a quite a simple project. It has on two ends of that rectangular space all the cores in the middle, a very flexible office space, in a way typical Japanese, very big space. And then the lower 50 meters are kind of podium building with retail, shopping, um, things like that. The podium itself has a, rela a, a physical a volume relation to some of the neighbors called they are similar height buildings, older buildings, newer buildings, a, a vital mixture of architectures all around. Has a, has a mall in the middle following all the way through the building. Has, because it has a significant portion of offices on top of that, you need an additional prestigious office entrance on one side. That is how it looks like. And then you have that shopping. And there was a late decision done. You remember I told you that the, the, the guy who runs that company originally coming from publishing music, they had a music hall in Osaka historically. And then there was a late decision done getting that again into the building. So on the seventh floor on top of the shopping and under the offices, they wanted to have a big foyer and an opera house. And so we put it on top of that between that, that uh, big, big transfer beam construction for the offices and on top of the, sh uh, the shopping, that kind of opera house are providing facilities for music performances, for theater, for as well traditional Japanese theater. On top again, uh, offices, very flexible, very normal in a way. And that looks really like the overall Japanese office. There's a difference because we can open the window. and we. We can not just open the window completely like we do here. We also are able to, to just open this part of the window, which is perforated. And with a handle, you can handle as well this small flap. And so you can decide whether you get a little air in or more air in. And you need as well the big openings for maintenance. There is a glass shield outside, an additional one. It's a very, very a uh, narrow kind of double skin facade just to provide enough space for the sun, um, for the sun shading system. It gets a, a Caspi S-Class rating, which is the highest Japanese energy rating. It provides 50% of the year natural ventilation, uh, gets a, an award from the Tall Building Council. And so the resume is, it is in a very, very difficult climate zone. Because this, this is quite difficult, possible to build a building like that. Meanwhile, which is not in the show, uh, we, all, uh, we also finished a building, completed a building in, in Singapore with a similar construction. Um, this is some university work we did, uh, one big, oh, excuse me, one big scale project for the biggest Irish university, the UCD, University College of Dublin. Uh, near to the bay in Dublin, uh, quite a windy place. Um, the, the site was a donation from some donors in the 70s. They built a lot of buildings there, 60s, 70s building. Quite good building, well maintained, nothing special, but no campus in a way. Because the campus for me is a field in the middle where you can orientate to, where you get an identification uh, for the whole uh, university for, uh, and this is not, was not the case. So our design foreseen uh, a kind, this kind of double ring or eight uh, shape design uh, to make sure that by, by, by demolishing some of the buildings in the middle, by keeping some, by renovating some, by getting some new buildings all around, that all together at the end, when, the, when this is all uh, completed, it's again a real campus which is an enjoyable environment for uh, as well the students as for visitors. Gives you an, an impression about that roof construction, timber roof construction, timber facade construction. Um, it's all about that roof because we, um, we protect the building with a roof uh, about the wind. And at the same time, we use it for photovoltaic cell uh, farm and as well for uh, a 1.5 kilometer long uh, wind turbine, a small one on top of that, um, of that roof, and on, in three steps, 500 meter long, so it's 1.5 kilometer at all, provides a significant part of the energy we use. This is a full energy cycle. I don't want to go, to go too much into detail. I would like to draw your attention to this point here. 
What we are doing for providing energy for the whole campus, additionally to that, is we will build three big wind turbines in the Bay of uh, Dublin, and we get energy from there, and as well, we will have a real deep piling, 4.5 kilometer deep, where we get uh, 90 to 100 degree water out, and that means it's not just for, uh, for heating and cooling the building, it will be hopefully providing a temperature which makes it possible to run a steam machine, um, and then you get as well electricity out of that. This is definitely a technology which is very, very interesting as well for other regions in the world, because if you can pile as deep as that without causing trouble with earthquakes, which can be and which has to be well engineered, but then you're really solving a part of the energy problems you have. Um, it's carbon free, it gets a BREEAM outstanding rating. Um, the building uh, looks like that and, it, and, and the photo in a way represents one another idea that maybe the spaces in between architecture are even more important than the architecture itself. As I always ask the question, do you remember a building on the Champs-Élysées or on the Via Veneto or uh, around the Central Park? Nobody really realizes that they are prestigious or good or beautiful buildings. They all remember the beautiful garden, beautiful alley, beautiful street, beautiful plazas. And I think, as architects, I have to say, we should stay a little bit behind and say, okay, the importance of architecture might be big, but not, not as big as public space and, and place for the people. You see here, what we at the end provide is a space between buildings, a, a space where you're safe, you feel enjoyable, you, you, can, you can enjoy beautiful days and get into contact to other students, things like that. I show you a project from Germany which is recently completed a trade fair, 100,000 square meter in Hamburg. Two things are interesting for today about that. One is it is an inner city fair, so we are pretty much uh, pretty avoiding additional traffic. And the second one is it is a 100,000 square meter timber construction um, with FSC rating. And it might be not as elegant as a steel construction, but it's much sustainable. And I think together with the engineers, we developed a quite beautiful construction, which is, by the way, possible to deal with the neighbors as well. As you see in the mirror here, it's uh, surrounded by very beautiful 19th century buildings. And we had to provide buildings that are, that are uh, in the proportion, in the scale, which, um, which is acceptable for these people. Uh, originally, it was foreseen to have, to have just black box buildings, rectangular uh, trade fair buildings. And we made sure within that extremely restricted budget that we get a little, squeeze a little bit out for doing that bypass to the street, parallel to the, to the boulevard, to make sure that people are not just allowed to follow their pass through the halls, but at the same time having that kind of bypass to that loggia space and then can run through it and somewhere decide to get back into the trade fair. Uh, this is one of the most recent buildings we have completed for the European Investment Bank in Luxembourg, which is the biggest investment bank in the world, uh, positioned in Luxembourg because they're attracting a lot of money there. It's, uh, it is owned by the EU. Um, it is an extension to one of the 60s building there. On the right side, you see Dennis Lassen's um, building from the end of the 60s, beginning of 70s, which was the original headquarter of the bank. And then there's an extension in between from the 80s. Not a very beautiful building. The 70s building is very beautiful. The 80s is a little bit postmodern for my taste. And so we had to keep a little distance to it and make this extension, which is, which is mainly a horizontal glass tube kind of uh, glass house, and then these zigzag offices inside. Uh, it's a little bit difficult, because the site itself, because it has a three-story level difference between the street and uh, the valley, and as well along the street, another difference of three levels. So it's an iceberg. It shows just 50%, 40-50% of its volume to the visitor above ground. That is how it looks like. Drop-off zone, again, two entrance halls, two atrias uh, from three facing other streets are entrance halls. This is one of them. 
very transparent again, a very uh, hopefully elegant solution with that beam on top providing the fixation for, um, for that cable net construction, um, louvres to ventilate the place, some details. That is one of the entrance halls with, with, with the reception desk as well. Just the opposite of the street is Dominic Perrault's uh, uh, European uh, Human Right Court uh, Yard project. This is the entrance hall from, from inside. It's, uh, it's a place where the elevators are positioned as well as stairways. Uh, they use it as well for sport facilities and some joy events for the staff doing badminton or things there. We like that because we think as well for Lufthansa, the, the role a company plays for, their, for the staff is uh, especially um, in these places where the people commute it and they commute mainly not on a daily but on a weekly basis. So they're just weekend visitors as, at home and stay the whole week with the company. You, you have to provide more than just an office space. And that is the responsibility of not just the client but also the architect and engineers. Um, the winter gardens on the, on, the, on the side of the valley are connected by these kind of stairs. It is all covered by that glass tube. We have these triangular windows openable to ventilate um, the winter gardens. A little bit more in detail. This is where the stairs follow the shape of the valley on the valley side of the winter gardens. Came come outside, you can enter the valley itself, you can enjoy a little bit the garden and then get back to work. This is a space under the buildings. Um, that, that is a zigzag office layout, corridors, very transparent again. This is a typical conference or office space. Um, this is my clients sitting around a table. This is uh, a conference room again. What you have to know is that that is all behind that kind of steel and glass shield coming all around uh, as well, not just the winter garden, but also the office wings. Behind that, again, a, a purely timber frame uh, facade construction. There are, uh, in the, where, where the zigzag comes together, we have meeting points that might represent uh, another issue that we are normally doing the interior and the full fit out for the clients integrated into the architectural design that has to do with the, with the structure of our clients, which are mainly self-users, so people who do a competition, we enter a competition, sometimes win it, and then we are responsible for the end user at the same time, because it's not a developer in between, normally. It's not always like that. That is a connection between old and new building, quite long, 90 meters. It's providing an open public terrace on top of that, beautiful view to the city of Luxembourg. And this is part of that partly underground situation. You can maybe imagine how that works. On the right, there's a street level. And then to the left, it's going down, down, down to the valley. And that is uh, level mi minus two. So it's possible to natural lighting, light as well, these under, partly underground um, portions of the building. This is then the cafeteria, a 90 meter uh, wet, uh, 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 wall painting from uh, Michael Craig Martin, an English artist, a very beautiful thing. Um, and the cafeteria helps the people overcome the distance between the buildings. They use it at least two to three times a day. It's a, it's a nearly 24-hour uh, facility. So many from the people from the old building and so and, and, and the new building commute there and, and meet people from the new building. I think it, it has a role in the social life of the building. This is the outside terrace, according to it. It gets first time in continental Europe and British uh, rating, Bream, excellent. Um, we get that not just for the design, we get it as well, and we are quite proud about that, one year after completion, because it gets, they come back and measured the completed building again, the performance of it, and then gave us the excellent. We had just very good before, and we got the higher rating, the excellent, then after completion. Um, we had to pro 
to, to, to desi decide for an energy rating system, and that was some dream. It could have been a Swiss one or a German one or a French one, but we had to decide for one because there's no common European one. This is um, the shelter with the triangular openings. Again, the tube, the triangles again. This is the thing from outside, from inside. This is the typical winter garden, the whole issue. It has three to four different temperature zones. The blue one represents the outside temperature around, let's say, minus 20 to minus, to, to plus minus. And then winter gardens are between 10 to 20. The warm atria to the street are a little bit heated because we, we, we use them as uh, vertical access to elevators and stairways and things, bridges. Um, so they are between 15 to 20 something, and the offices are above 20. And this is one of the winter gardens, the untempered one in winter. In summer, it has a maximum of 26 degrees. We cool the building by activating the, the thermal masses uh, with geothermal equipment again. So we're getting in, for example, in summer with 17 degree water and in winter with 27 degree water. Quite low temperature spread, very healthy, big surfaces, low air change rated ra ratings and uh, ra rates, excuse me, and very, very slow air movement in, in the environment. And then with outside temperature of minus 10, it gets to a minimum of 6 degree uh, and uh, in an office is a minimum of 21 degree. Uh, helping, I mean, it helps to have a good district heating. In this case, it has 21% lower uh, primary energy rating than natural gas, which helps in the rating in Bream. This is, again, the, uh, the, the atrium. And then on top of that, we, have, we had, again, to find a solution for releasing the air, quite similar to Lufthansa, smoke extract as well, this time integrated into the flat uh, curved canopy or glass roof, and this how it looks from a little bit far away. It gets again a Reba International Award and a Chicago Ateneum Award and a an European Architecture Award and as well the Emilio Ambas Award for Green Building. And I, I, I will jump over this because this is not maybe not so interesting in detail. We did a project for Tishman Spire, kind of def def the, how do you call that, redensification process for La Défense in Paris. Um, and at the same time, they wanted to build more buildings there. They wanted as well to have residential buildings there. So we made a project together with them with a suggestion to build on a traffic corner on level 1 to 50, um, something which looks like that. So I come to recently finished or buildings that are still on site, quite a bit also smaller buildings. This is uh, a residential tower we built in Hamburg in the Harbor City. It is a design according to wind, sun, and noise, um, and as, as well the view. The views are to the River Elbe and to the sea. Um, obviously, we are orientating the terraces to there. The noise is luckily coming from the other side, so we had to provide double skin uh, windows to provide a more uh, close facade to that noisy side, and then exposure to the sun, because there are mainly people in the building which are at home late afternoon to evening. They want to enjoy the afternoon sun, so that was obvious, and we could use the sun as, as well for solar thermics on the roof. And then we raised the whole structure uh, six to seven meters into the air to make sure that it is positioned on that stair. We're providing a little bit more public space as well, and th that is how it looks like. And there's another problem. It's the wind, because the wind is coming from the same direction as the view is and the sun exposure is. And we found out in a wind tunnel test that the best position for an open terrace in the wind is really directly into the wind. So you're not facing it with a shoulder, you're facing it directly, so it lowers a little, and, and it keeps it quite quiet in that place. You, you can use that terraces the main time of the year, and if it's not possible, then we provide another uh, sliding glass panels, and we make it a kind of winter garden then. 
So that is how it looks like. It gets a half in city echo label in gold. Um, that is mainly about the mixture of energy we are, we are producing. We take community heating with a primary energy, energy factor of about uh, 0.5, which is a very, very good primary energy rating. We, we, we didn't do anything about that because that is given. And then we had a cogeneration unit, a fuel cell, and solar thermal on roof. And that mixture together gave us the gold. Um, this is how it looks like from there. I think it's a beautiful, small apartment building, quite um, beloved by the people there. We recently finished a, uh, a building in Düsseldorf, so-called Sky Office, a, a relatively small 70, 80 meter high rise, a purely office high rise, a little bit of an interesting shape. The shape is quite rational, much more rational than you think. Uh, it's coming from two cores in the middle and then an ongoing belt of offices all around. You are allowed to build offices naturally ventilated and lighted in Germany about seven, eight meters deep, 2.5 times the clear height of the, the interior space. And then we, we get from the distance of the core to, the, to, to that peak here, we get deeper spaces as well for communication, conferences, reception, open offices, things like that. So it's a quite rational building for lawyers and for consulting companies who need a lot of single offices or double offices around the building, all around the building without any uh, exemption. And then we are providing deeper space for other things. What is essential is always the surface volume ratio and the best would be the circle. The competition had a quite good rating here and the, fit, the complete design then, the optimization of it, had one or has one which is quite near to a circle, uh, surprisingly near, which means this is a very, very compact building still. This is how it looks like, gives an impression. Very different from different sites. Partly it looks really round building and then it gets back to something which is split again. This is the facade, the double skin facade, mainly because of the noise uh, of the street. And then it has the same, so every double skin facade is it's ventilated. You can open the window. It was tested in a lot of mock-up tests to make sure that this shape helps us to get the used air out into the environment and not as fresh air back into the building. Very, very, very important because if you don't get that to work, it hires the temperature from, from one level to the, to the other. And then it gets really into trouble because you get then 30, 40, nearly 50 degree Celsius in the cavity and that is not what we are looking for. Um, has a low balustrade to open the view. Has a slab activation as well for heating and for cooling. Uh, it has an induction unit uh, near to the facade, a decentral air handling unit system to cool and heat it. Additionally, um, this is where we get the internal air back. Gives you an impression about the fit out, uh, which is provided from the developer in this case. Um, that is a detail of the induction unit. I don't want to explain that into um, de detail. This is, I mean, it's, it's not just a quite rational shape Although it's looking emotional, I think it's a beautiful building with a very, very simple detail at the very end. And that is the top of the building. And the There are a few buildings on site. One is a university building for a private don a donor, um, the, the economical um, faculty in Düsseldorf. It's situated in a kind of hidden uh, uh, lake. Um, very beautiful in a way. Um, it's that curved building making its part of the shore of that small lake. Uh, we have the conference rooms in ground floor and then as well professor assistant, professors, students and people sitting openly on two terrace levels. On front of that uh, a, a kind of wooden stair coming all the way down to the small lake Without the stair, it looks actually like that today. 
um, is pre-assessed in the German rating system in gold. It has, uh, it has a very, very good daylight use factor. It has an outside sun shading. Uh, it has as well natural ventilated single offices and natural ventilated uh, atria or gallery of space. Um, we do rainwater harvesting, things like that. Again, we are using geothermal equipment to heat and cool the building. And, and that is what, what it was supposed to look like. This is the building site today. It gives you an impression on what kind of project we are working today. Um, it has a zinc facade, uh, especially with some, yeah, it's folded and uh, gets later a little bit grayer. Hopefully, today it's really shiny. That is how it looks like today. We're doing a project for Swarovski, headquarters of Swarovski Financial Operations and Mar International Marketing uh, on the Lake Zurich, directly on the lake. Very beautiful site with a view to the Alps. It's really possible with good weather to see all these Alps. So we built that building about that view in a way, um, a kind of U-shaped building towards the lake shore in between these wine yards, a very, very beautiful site, very beautiful climate as well. Uh, I think everywhere where you can plant and have wine, the, the weather must be beautiful and, 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 and spectacular, as you know from California. Um, this is the shape of the building facing the lake, and uh, on top of the building we have a photovoltaic plant again. This is the ground floor with all these uh, conference and co community and, and restaurant facilities. Um, and then on top of that, we have an, off an open office landscape for roughly 150 to 200 people. And just in the back, there is some, there is some single offices and uh, meeting rooms which are necessarily single with a transparent facade all around. Meeting rooms here and, 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 and meeting areas. And then an open landscape again has a Swiss Minergy Echo rating. Uh, this is much, much tougher than the Germans are. Um, give you an impression, uh, the 25% in Lufthansa uh, were below 100 kilowatt per square meter and annum, and this one is below 40 kilowatt per annum and square meter, which is really, really difficult to get. Um, and it's including heating, cooling, and electricity. Uh, there are many, many factors um, helping us with that, but there's one factor which I would like to draw your attention to. This is the lake water use we have. We are getting water from the lake 70 meter away from the shore um, in uh, a deepness of 10 to 50 meters. You have a quite constant lake temperature, and you can use that. You have a suction pipe and a return pipe, a relatively warmer return pipe. We had to put that underground because in front of us are very prestigious uh, sites where you can't go with uh, above ground digging through, through the site. Um, this is how it was put in place. Um, this is the facade. gives an impression uh, how, how, how that looks. And there is a very special um, point in that building again. As you might realize here already, it's a clear glass facade no windows in, but it has these kind of louvers here, and as well here, and as well in front of the slab. And there's where we use it. We are just having a double skin facade for uh, having sun shading again in, in the cavity. Uh, sun shading, uh, glare shade, the same. Slab activation, as you know. And then we're getting the air in through that bracket which is just in front of the slab and get the air as well out here. This is the in interior in the model, in the mock-up space, and this is uh, the maintenance access to the facade. One of the mock-ups showing that. And there is a detail which I would like to explain here or here. And that, that is covered by this perforated glass met, um, steel metal. And the perforation is all the same. But one element is 
air intake and the other one is air outtake. And because we have this alteration, again, we are not getting the used air into uh, the, the, the upper spaces. And then this is the air intake in the interior and the outtake as well. And so it looks from outside quite simple, but in fact behind is a quite diverse technique. This is the detail. Again, it's ventilated. And when you open that flap and you get fresh air into the building via that grill, and if you open it in the other direction, you release the air to the outside. This is how it looks, looked recently. It's a building site. That is uh, the view you have from there. And you share that with everybody in the, in the space all around towards the out. The last project I would like to show is a building we are actually building in uh, Sydney, uh, in the central business district of Sydney. Um, Sydney is, again, a quite hot place in summer uh, and not very cool in, in winter. The building is in the middle of the central business district facing the harbor. It is very privileged because in front of the building to the harbor, we have just uh, heritage buildings or buildings that are in a restricted height zone. So we have a free view to the harbor and back from the harbor to the building. So we are part of the postcard view of Sydney. So there were strong reasons for the design. Uh, one aspect is that the city grid of Sydney is quite rectangular. And just in our place, it turns into diagonal. Um, and that causes some trouble. We had some trouble finding the right form. And that elliptical form on the very bottom, uh, which was also developed in a quite intensive design process, has for us the advantage that every rectangular form would have shown the shoulder to the harbor, just a small elevation. And what we wanted to have is a form which is able to react on that irregular shape and at the same time turned into the view. And you see, by positioning this white course, we blocked out a very high neighbors, the tall neighbors, where you have no view, and we opened the building to all the views we have. And this is, for example, the view to Bondi Beach and towards the National Library. And this is how the building is positioned. So you have an open view between Aurora Place from Piano and, and the other building on the left side. And then there was an additional decision done that we raise the whole building um, to 20 meters upwards. The, the reason for that is very simple. We wanted to get a rating from the city of Sid Sydney about design excellency that gives 10% extra to the developer. Uh, we were successful with that. And then we provided, again, another 10% uh, openly natural ventilated space, which is free, which is not part of the GFA. Um, so the building has 20%, roughly 20% extra. And one of the decisions that has been necessary for that is to raise the building to provide a public space under the building. And the same time we are doing that, um, we provided a first floor, which has already the view to the harbor. And that helps the client as well, getting a higher rent and makes the building possible. This is the space under the building, a big stair exposed to the sun in winter, shaded by the building in summer. So we expect that to be a very comfortable place, a winter garden facade. Um, like California, uh, Sydney has the advantage against Germany that you don't have to have all these fixed and closed facade details. You can leave it a little open. They are not afraid of leaving a building open, really. The minimum temperature in summer is, a, is around 16, 70, 80 degrees. Very, very comfortable climate. I guess a six-star uh, rating from the Australian Green, green stuff system, that's about the double skin, which we are providing for all the offices. 50% of the surface of the building is um, natural ventilatable. Um, it has a natural ventilated atrium, which is maybe the most special feature in the building, 150 meter high, um, has solar cooling on the roof, has rainwater and blackwater treatment as well. It uses 60% recycled concrete. It uses 90% recycled steel and fully recycled or FSC uh, rated timber. Um, this is a typical office uh, floor and, and what it has is 
it has really that flexible open space towards the harbor and Bondi, and then it has where the sun is never in Australia, so it's south, facing south, and atrium, which is naturally ventilated from here. We get cool air in from here and then release it as well to the top of the building and to the office spaces across on both sides. And a double skin again with solar, um, with, with sun shading in the cavity and as well at the same time cavity blinds. You might know that from California in, in, in Sydney, it's like you're visiting the most beautiful buildings, the most recent buildings, like Aurora Place from Piano, for example, and they have open trading floors there. They have the most beautiful, beautiful view in the world. Really, it is a beautiful setting. And they close it completely because of, their, of, of the glare screens. And what we do with the double skin is, we take the sun shading system outside the normal building, outside the thermal line, in the cavity, we protect it against the wind. The same time you do that, you can use it all the year as well for glare protection. And because it is a horizontal louver, we found out in the tests that 90% of the working hours in Sydney, you can keep it open, you can keep it horizontal, or 10% sliding, that's it, for 90%. So then you have in a high rise an open view at the same time you get the sun and the glare out. And that is a big advantage because you're not selling just the view, you have it already. Yeah? And you have it also as a result of that engineering and not just if you open, unallowed, open mm. the screen. This is a diagram showing the 50%, the green zone representing the 50% where with, with the humidity and the temperature in Sydney it's sensible. Uh, and, and sustainable to open the windows. Um, this is again a kind of blade construction where we make sure that the used air gets thrown out and not in. And this is a transparency the building has. Um, a view to the bridge and give you an impression from the building side uh, about that, mainly about the atrium. This was a model. This is now what it looks like today. You see the exposed concrete surface from the ground floor, from the hall, and then you look into 50% uh, roughly of the atrium. Um, the atrium has a quite sharp sh shaped, uh, curved shape um, with balconies in, with bridges in, with the elevators in. So what it really is, I think, is not just a beautiful resource for fresh air or 10% extra floor uh, space. It is mainly meant to be a community space because what you not, not ha have in a normal office uh, environment is you don't, you don't meet anybody. Uh, instead, you're going to an elevator or whatever to a party. Uh, what we do here is everybody who enters a building and uses it will look into the environment of the other tenants from the back of the building and get an impression about the community uh, that you have in a building like that, which is for a high-rise, I think, a very, a very good communication aspect as well. This is how it looks like today. Gets, uh, again, awards before completion. Um, this is a building site. This gives you an impression about the view. Um, that's 50% of the building, so it's a pretty much prestigious view to the harbor around the neighbors and from Faha Place where the steps are. So the question is, uh, can we do a kind of resume after the show? I would say, yes, we do that since 19, 20 years. Um, it has been always a question, can you go beyond the regulation? Is there something which drives you not just getting the points or the certification, but is there something behind that? Yes, there is something beyond certification. I, I strongly believe that some engineers, talented people, talented young architects can sit together and invent completely new things uh, if they are able, willing, if the situation is like that. Um, it always starts with a construction. I, I can't understand architects who avoid the direct contact to the engineers and the construction engineers and structural engineers as especially. Um, I think it all starts with a very, very good and sustainable and light construction. Uh, it could be very, very simple. 
does not have to be necessarily decorative or complicated. It is possible not just to use green technologies, but let the building look green and, and have real physically green in and around the building is as well, at, at least, uh, same important. Um, I think it is about big structures, let them be not too important, let the public space be important. Maybe sometimes you have even to hide a structure like that, a huge building like that is 500 meters long, 100 meters wide, 10 to 12 meters high. So it's a huge structure which is completely hidden. Um, this is possible, it's needed. I mean in an environment Los, Los Angeles for sure, as well as in Stuttgart. It can be done in every scale, it can be done everywhere. It might have different solutions, yes, but it's the same approach that drives us. Um, it is again about public space and not so much architecture. It is also about cities and how we avoid se segregating all these functions in a city, getting that back again in one city together. That, that avoids a lot of traffic. You know that uh, a man or a woman driving 10 kilometers a day from work to home uses more oil and energy than his four-head family at home the whole year. So this is, this is the, the, the point where a city like Atlanta or Los Angeles has problems with, I think. Um, and it can be very beautiful, I think. It, I, I mean, at the end, as an architect, I have to say, we are also designers. I mean, we are not just engineers or uh, people who are interested in energy ratings. At the end, we are desperately looking for beautiful solutions and social community structures. Um, and yeah, that's how it is. At the very end, I have to say, as an architect, you have not just responsibility for these things. As we, as we experienced with the building for the International Criminal Court in The Hague and in, in, in the Netherlands, um, it's also about making, for example, this building understandable and readable for people all around the world, not just for European-based or American or South American, uh, coming more or less from the same cultural background, but for people all around the world, coming at, as witnesses or as lawyers, judges, and so on to that place, and sitting all together trying to get a solution for heavy crimes that has been done by state governments around the world. Um, and that is another dimension of responsibility an architect could take uh, beside green building and beauty and social responsibilities. Thank you very much. <laughs>